everyone, it's Tiny Tom Logan back with another video for you and today we're going to be taking a look at the overclocking and the gaming performance of the Ryzen 5 3600. So it's the 3600 non-X version. It comes in around the £190 mark in the UK. Now it's 6 cores, 12 threads and you get a 3.6 base with up to a 4.2 gigahertz boost and normally that 4.2 gigahertz is around the kind of like the single core kind of mark but it, it does um, fully loaded sometimes depending on your cooling and, and such flow up around there as well. Now I did say it was going to be about overclocking performance and we have done a full review on the OC3D website, we can go and see all of the normal sort of stuff that we do with all of our blender graphs. We see big fat graphs with all of the other CPUs in, but then we've also done a performance review with the games as well. And normally with a CPU review, we would only use a few games because obviously we do a big batch of tests and it's normally like 20 odd pages long on the website. We took a little bit of a different approach with this one where we've done the normal stuff, but then we've also done a full suite of games off of our gaming bench list as well. But then we kind of spun that on its head and we, we, we've started using a 2080 Ti for the gaming test. But then we thought, well, it'd be nice if we put a 5700 XT in there as well. So we're not doing this in a red versus green graphics card kind of scenario, but we are doing in how well does the 3600 cope with the two best graphics cards from each of the teams available at the moment. And we've done, we've focused on 1080p and 4K. Now with 1080p, that's gonna see either the limits of the CPU because the frames are going to be high. But then when we flick over to 4K, the uh, graphics cards and spread its wings a little bit more and it takes more of the ownership of the benchmark numbers. Uh, and But then it's also then kind of nice to see how well, if you were to build a system like this, how well it, would it run if you wanted to build a 4K big rig with a big graphics card, but only a small kind of uh, lower end, so not low end, but lower end CPU in it, maybe compared to something like the 3800X and the uh, 3900X, or maybe even later on the uh, 3950. Now, obviously, I've already said that it's six cores and 12 threads, so a lot of games, are, that's going to be ample for them anyway, but you'll be able to see if there are games in there that will kind of take advantage of more cores. Um, one of the things we did do with the memory is we got it running 3600 megahertz memory really easily. It's pretty much DOCP favorite now, and it's something that in our test rig we go straight in with and it runs absolutely fine. One thing I would say with this is you can push past the 3600 megahertz really easily, but it does get a little bit complicated and the memory controller in it isn't as strong as some of the other ones. I mean, you can get 4000 if you want, but I would personally say that 3600 megahertz is a sweet spot. And if you wanted to know where I wouldn't go below, I personally, and I've been saying this for a long time, not just with the Ryzen stuff, I wouldn't go below 3200 megahertz. So 3200 megahertz is a start. 3600 megahertz is a, uh, a sweet point. Sometimes with some uh, of the CPUs, you may need to get in and get a little bit handy with the BIOS, but these new Ryzen chips do seem to be okay with just DOCP. If you do want to go in and kind of tame some of the volts and you can actually trim some of the temperatures back a little bit as well. When we did do the overclocking on this, we did manage to get 4.3 gigahertz across all six of the cores. Now this was actually quite a big deal because with some of the other Ryzen processors, now that the uh, GISA code has been updated and things are boosting correctly, this actually meant that we got a, uh, an actual boost over the single core performance because the 3900X, for example, single core uh, turbo on its own is 4.6 gigahertz, but you, we haven't found a processor yet that we've been able to get all of the cores running at 4.6. And you end up normally running about 4.4 gigahertz, which means when you overclock it for multi-threaded applications, it's quicker. But for single threaded applications, it actually then becomes a little bit slower, which is a bit of a catch 22. And yes, you do have the option of things like precision boost overdrive and stuff like that. But still, you, you, it does, it's a very gray area and I could make an entire video based on that and that alone. But with this, 
you can actually go from that single core boost as being 4.2, but you can actually push all of them that little bit further. So this is actually a processor that uh, you will get a positive result from the overclocking across the board, both games, benchmarks, synthetics, you know, normal desktop use, everything will get a tasty boost and it's actually kind of nice as well. Temperatures can get a little bit warm because it does need a fair bit of volts to keep it up at 4.3, but the most important thing to remember at 4.3 is it was stable across all of our benches. So that includes OCCT, but more impressively than anything else, it's Blender stable. And Blender's normally the one program out of everything that will fall over if something's not 100% right. It could pass Prime, for example, with small FFTs, but you bang Blender on and within a couple of minutes it's decided to turn itself off and it's either got too hot or just fallen over because of instability. And this didn't, so that's a very, very positive thing. Uh, Cinebench absolutely whizzes through, the scores look pretty good. Obviously, I'm going to stress that, you know, compared to the other multi-cord Ryzen's, they don't, but you do need to remember this is only 190 quid and you do still get a nice little boost with that overclocking. So moving on to the games testing. Now I'm going to bring the graph up just quick. This is the one that we've put in the main video, sorry, the main review on the website. And this is the 1080, 1440 and 4K results across the few games that we do because we just do a select few because it's a cpu review and not a gaming review uh, but what we've now done is we've actually done some extra tests where we've done our full gaming suite with the cpu and two very different graphics cards very very different price points so the 5700 xt and the 2080 ti now the 2080 ti is going to stress and find the limits of that cpu but the 5700 xt will give you kind of a comparison to see if the game is being bottlenecked by the CPU or whether there is headroom there for a better graphics card. So it's a good way for us to be able to see the difference. And with Borderlands 3, which you can already see playing, you can see them side by side. Borderlands, uh, you can see the 5700 XT got to 72.3, but the CPU blatantly had a little bit more to give that game because the 2080 Ti actually then managed to score that little bit more. And that was the point that we were trying to make, is when you get a score that's very, very similar, you know the CPU will be the limiting factor at 1080p. But when there's a gap between the two, as we would expect, you then know that for argument's sake, 100% that the 5700 XT isn't being bottlenecked. So that's a really good kind of way to go with it. When you move on to DSX, there's eight frames between it, so it's very narrow, so you might get to the point where you, the uh, 5700 is okay, but you can pretty much say that with the 2080 Ti, it's kind of being hemmed in a little bit. Same with F118. They're both side by side, uh, but you can see that the frames per second are very similar. One of the things I will say though, is you, if your eyes are like mine, I will say that the AMDs across all of these games seem to look that bit nicer. Now I know some people are going to say uh, that you're going to need to uh, go in and tweak some settings in the Nvidia stuff to make it look better, but with the AMD stuff, it just works out of the box. And I've never seen enough come from Nvidia about tweaking said settings and why aren't they done out of the box. Uh, Far Cry 5, very, very similar results. You can pretty much guarantee here that the limiting factor on those frames per second is going to be that CPU. Uh, but it is a good CPU bound game. We do like Far Cry 5 for CPU kind of stuff. Ghost Recon Wildlands, you can actually see that you get, get a performance increase here with the 2080 Ti. So the 5700 XT is going to be happy, but the 2080 Ti is probably being hemmed in a little bit. Monster Hunter World. This is definitely one where you don't have to worry with the 5700 XT. The, um, the 3600 has got more than enough grunt to keep that graphics card happy. And to be honest with you, it looks with this game that it's got more than enough grunt to even keep the 2080 Ti happy to a fair degree as well. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, very, very close results, uh, but you know, not a massive amount between them in reality does look nice again, definitely see a difference with the AMD between these two. I am going to be showing you a graph at the end, by the way, so you don't necessarily need to worry um, about me shouting these results at you. Uh, there will be a big graph at the end. 
The Division 2, big gap between these two, absolutely massive gap. Um, you need to remember that it is 1080p, but we do run everything at Ultra. When we go to Total Warhammer, both of the Total Warhammers are very, very CPU bound games. It's one of the reasons why we run them in our CPU tests. So these two, the results are fairly close between the two. So although you're gonna get a little bit of an increase because of the 2080 Ti, it's genuine, generally not enough that you wouldn't assume that they're both being um, CPU limited. With the 4K results magically appearing on the screen, essentially with these, you can see that there's a big difference in between the uh, frames per second. Now we've not done any actual recordings of these. We wanted to keep it um, CPU focused, but there is a fairly big jump between the two. Uh, it's, in some regards, it's not as close as you may think, but you can pretty much pick out within those graphs, because I'll go this way, you can pick out within the graphs that it's, uh, you, you still might get a point where the 2080 Ti is not being necessarily fed enough. CPU grunt, and I'll, we will call it just plain megahertz, because that's the most important thing. And at 4.3, you know, it, the, the numbers would be very different if we were running a five gigahertz processor, for example. But with that, it would be completely unfair because a five gigahertz processor with that many cores isn't gonna be costing 190 pound. So the reason why we did those tests was just to give you an idea of the kind of performance you could get if, for argument's sake, I don't know, you get to borrow a 2080 Ti or you've won one or, you know, the, the graphics card is the most important bit of your system. And to be fair, you probably should spend the most amount of money on your system on the graphics card if it's going to be a dedicated gamer. I don't particularly think that a 2080 Ti and a 3600 would be an amazing match anyway. 2080, 2080S, maybe, you know, a little bit lower down the spectrum with the 70, stroke 70S, yes. 5700 XT, definitely yes. I think the 5700 XT and a 3600 is a brilliant kind of uh, place to put your pennies if you're looking at a fast gaming rig with the possible option of maybe a little bit of streaming or some like video rendering or something like that, but you're still kind of hemmed in on a budget, but gaming is the focus. And for 190 pound, this is actually a little bit of a cracker. And it's the sort of thing where, like I said, if you wanna build yourself a good gaming rig with some you know, crossover points, but with the gaming being the stressful focus, then this is an absolute brilliant um, CPU. One of the things I would say is at this kind of price point as well, if you are looking for motherboards, then unless you're going to get yourself a PCI Express 4 um, SSD, I would be looking around the kind of 37 uh, X370 and the X470 motherboards, uh, because then you're gonna be able to save yourself a little bit of money. Uh, so if you're already on one of those boards and you've got a lower end graphics card and you want to, you know, you want to upgrade six cores, 12 threads, and that's going to be a brilliant point to kind of jump in. But where there's so much extra technology and stuff going on with the X570 boards, they're all kind of a fair bit more expensive. So when you're looking at a Strix, for example, is coming in around the £250 mark, it kind of unweights it and you're not going to get enough extra out of the uh, Strix to warrant spending that little bit extra money. But for example, if you could get yourself or, you know, like a cheap X470 board, for example, maybe last gen's X470 Strix, for example, and you managed to pick that up for 150, 180 pounds, then you're not gonna be getting any less performance from this part, and you're not gonna be getting any less performance from your graphics cards either. Because the PCI Express 4 side of things Although it sounds great and it is a little bit more future-proof, we've still not got anything other than those um, M.2 drives that are really using the extra bandwidth. Now, I did test X370, X470 and X570, and it was only really the hard drive capabilities uh, that was really kind of the bit that I was focusing on. And until they started locking it down in the BIOS, you could actually still get PCI Express 4 speeds with a PCI Express 4 CPU, but on one of the older motherboards. Now there's a bit of gray area now because AMD and the manufacturers are starting to kind of close those kind of gray areas up by locking them down in the BIOS and it's 
something that really needs a bit more investigation to see what's happening. Um, but I think if you're you're spending this sort of money, you might not be looking at PCI Express 4 M.2 anyway. And it, it, PCI Express 3 speeds with an M.2 is absolutely insane anyway. So if you ended up with like this and a uh, cheap M.2 and then you had a big SATA or SSHD, then to be fair, you know, you're, you're going to be fairly happy. I did want to bring that up though, because it is something that is kind of, it keeps getting mentioned. And it is something that's starting to be closed down a little bit more. But it was a very, I still think, getting one of the older boards with something like this is a better fit. Say for instance, like maybe you're looking to upgrade your rig and you've already got an X470 Prime, then, you know, this is going to give you a lovely performance boost. Uh, but kind of keep those things in mind. Cooling-wise, I have already spoken about, but you can easily overclock and cool this with a normal, high-quality 120mm air cooler. And you can do all of that with the air cooler and it will run around the 75 degree mark-ish. If you're going AIO and stuff like that and you're going to be absolutely fine anyway. The cooler that comes in the box, I would personally say it's great for stock. But even then I'd be looking to try and find undervolts to keep the temperatures and the noise down. But all in all... The Ryzen 5 3600 is a cracking gaming CPU, and it's probably one of the best sub-200 pound CPUs I've seen in years.